This, this theme today is all about worship. But staying with the theme of Jesus is Jesus is worthy of our praise. Can somebody say amen? amen? Jesus is worthy of our praise. There's nobody else that deserves the praise except for Jesus. So we've come to worship him. We've come to declare. And I'm just going to take a moment uh, to try to build uh, some, I don't know, give some stepping stones, some, some tools to hang on to when it comes time to worship. There was a British minister by the name of W.E. Sangster who in the 1950s began to lose his vocal cords. The use of his vocal cords and his muscles began to deteriorate. He was uh, battling with a disease caused progressive, called, called progressive muscular atrophy. And he knew that he was losing his ability to minister effectively, but it became very apparent that he was, uh, it was about to take his life. And he began to cry out to the Lord, Lord, I, I know I may not any longer be able to lead, but give me something to do while I have breath in these lungs. And it was through that that he began to throw himself into writing and into praying. And he became an amazing writer and an amazing intercessor. But on the Easter Sunday, just weeks before he passed away, he took a journal out and began to write a letter to his daughter. And he said this, and it just hit me so hard when I read this, that and this, is, this is critical for us to get this morning. He wrote and he said, how terrible it is to wake up on Sunday morning and to not have a voice to be able to shout, he is risen. But how much more terrible it would be to wake up on Easter morning and have a voice to shout and not want to. And what I want to say to you, Freedom, it would be a terrible thing to come here today, to be here at Freedom Church this morning and not have a voice to shout. That would be sad. But you know what's worse than that? Being here and having a voice to shout, but not wanting to. That's even worse. And so I'm here to encourage you to get your shout on today. I mean, I'm here to encourage you to lift up a voice to Jesus. Can somebody say amen? Brother Jonathan, can I hear that organ over there just a little bit, brother? Come on, he's going to talk to me this morning. We're going to talk back and forth. Now listen, I, you may not have to shout out loud, but this is what I know. There has to be an expression from your heart to the Lord. Everybody has an expression, and everybody should give him an expression of your heart to the Lord. There was another man, a man by the name of R.C. Chapman, that somebody came up to him and said, said, R.C., how you doing today? And he said, I'm burdened, brother, I'm burdened. And the, the guy that asked him, his friend that asked him, was a little confused because he said he was burdened, but the look on his face was happy. He says, I, I don't get it. He said, well, I'm burdened with the blessings of the Lord. He said, I, I don't get that either. He said, well, I'm referring to Psalm 68, 19, that says, blessed be the Lord, or praise the Lord, who daily loads us with benefits. The God of our salvation, Selah. Selah means think about it. Think about it. So here's what I want you to think about. God, the blessed be the Lord, our God, who deserves our praise, daily loads us. He daily burdens us with benefits. He, daily, he puts, he overwhelms us. He puts loads of blessings Loads of benefits on us every single day. So my question for you today is, are you, are you being loaded with the burdens of the world? Are you being loaded with the blessings of the Lord? Because it's a matter of perspective. They're both there for you to take hold of every single day. You can take hold of the worries and the cares of this world. And you can be fearful and filled with anxiety and you can be stressed and you can be perplexed and you can be overwhelmed or you can be loaded with the blessings of the Lord and you can rise above every challenge and you can have a shout for the Lord. So that's what I'm going to challenge you to do today. I want to break down three words for you today that we use often interchangeably. Thanksgiving, praise, and worship. Thanksgiving, praise, and worship. And I want to show you what happens when we operate in thanksgiving, when we operate in praise, and when we operate in worship. 
Because this is going to be a key for any one of us to be able to pull ourselves out of depression. It's going to be a way to pull yourself out of fear. It's going to be a way to pull yourself out of sadness. This is the way to overtake all of the cares and the burdens of this world and to get loaded with the benefits of the Lord rather than loaded with the, 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 the burdens of the world. Thanksgiving, praise, and worship. Let me talk about Thanksgiving just for a minute. When we thank him, for what he has done, he listens to you. He listens to you. Don't you know that sometimes all you need is just somebody to listen to you? That's what my wife tells me all the time. Stop trying to fix it. Just listen. Just listen. The fact is sometimes we just need somebody to listen. In fact, Psalm 66, 17 says this. I cried to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, but God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. So when I begin to thank him and I thank him for what he's done, he listens to me. When I thank him for the times that he came through, when I thank him for the times that he delivered me, when I thank him for the times that he was there when nobody else was, when I thank him for the times that I couldn't see through the night, but he carried me through. When I thank him for what he's done, he listens to me. And sometimes we just need somebody to listen to us. So what happens when we don't listen or when we don't thank him? What happens when we choose to take the credit ourselves. Here's what Romans 121 says. It says, for although they knew God, and we are here because we know God, they knew God, neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. You know what futile means? Futile means incapable of producing a useful result. Incapable. It means pointless. Our thinking becomes pointless. Our thinking becomes incapable of producing a useful result. When we forget to thank him or when we refuse to thank him and we start patting ourselves on the back for the promotion, when we refuse to thank him and we start patting our back for the good things that are coming our way, our thinking becomes futile and our foolish hearts are darkened. In other words, when we refuse to give thanksgiving to God, when we refuse to thank him for everything that he's done in our past, that is a quick pathway to stupidity. That's what this is saying. Futile, foolish hearts. Choose gratitude instead of complaining. Complaining is not going to change the weather. Complaining is not going to change your circumstances. But it's been proven that the attitude of gratitude that the spirit of thanksgiving releases chemicals in your brain, the dopamine and the serotonin and the oxytocin, all the things that will make you happy and peaceful. So you can choose gratitude. You can choose thanksgiving and change your life, change your person, and that will allow you to change your circumstances. Or you can sit around and complain and nothing in your world is going to get any better. Thanksgiving, when we thank him, for what he's done, he listens. Praise. When we praise him for his awesome greatness, he comes and stands near. And what do I mean? When I say he, when we praise him for his awesome greatness, when we praise him in faith for what he's going to do. See, Thanksgiving is looking backwards at what he's done. Praise is looking forward for what he's going to do. I praise him. Because tomorrow's going to be better than today. I praise him because next Sunday is going to be better than this Sunday. I praise him because there are benefits and blessings that are coming in my life each and every day. I praise him because I know that the prayers that we prayed are being heard. I praise him because I know that there are prodigals that are coming home. I praise him because I know our praise is making a difference, not just here, but in our city and around this country. I praise him because I believe that the best is yet to come. I praise him because I believe there's a revival that's going to hit this country. It's going to shake this nation and it's going to allow God to be glorified again. I praise him because I know something good is coming. I thank him for what he's done. I praise him for what he's getting ready to do. But here's, here's what I want you to realize. When we praise him, he comes and he stands near. 
He's here. That's what Psalms 23 or 22, verse number three says, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. So when we begin to praise him, he just comes and stands near. And you may be saying, well, what good is that? Why don't I just need somebody to stand near? Let me tell you what happens whenever he comes and stands near. And it's best described by something that took place back in 1947 on May 13th in Cincinnati, Ohio, when the Los Angeles Dodgers went to play the Cincinnati Reds. And it was Jackie Robinson's inaugural season as the first African-American major leaguer playing for the Dodgers. And as they took the field at the bottom of the first inning, the crowds in Cincinnati were giving Jackie Robinson the business. But what happened? Pee Wee Reese, an all-star from Kentucky playing shortstop, left his position and walked over to first base and just put his arm around Jackie Robinson. And you know what happened? It silenced the crowd. That show of solidarity silenced the voices of the naysayers. It silenced the negative voices. And here's what happens when we begin to praise him. He comes and he stands near. And you know what he does? You know what his presence does? It silences the voices that are in your head. And I'm not, I'm not, listen, I'm not talking about schizophrenia here today. I'm talking about those negative voices that you hear echoing in the chamber of your mind. Those negative voices that says you're not making, you're not cut out for it. You can't make it through. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never do anything good. We hear those voices from negative impacts in our life from way on back and they continue to echo but when we begin to praise him he comes and he stands near and those voices are silenced we we silence our own negative voices many of us have voices when we look in the mirror and we think i I can't do it i can't make it I'll, i'll never i'll never be able to do it that's a negative voice but when we begin to praise him we praise him for what he's going to do he comes and he stands near and he silences the voice of our own voice inside of our head Satan comes to you and Satan often tries to tell you, remember that failure, remember that fault, remember your sin, remember what you did, remember what you did last week, remember what you did last year, remember what you did when you were a kid and he tries to remind you of every bad thing that ever happened in your life. But when you begin to praise him, and he comes and stands near, he silences the voice of Satan. He silences your negative voice. He silences the voice of the enemies out there that continue to echo in your mind. So when we thank him, he listens. When we praise him, he comes near. So what happens when we worship? When we worship, he works on our behalf. He begins to work on our behalf. Now, I want you to notice this. When we're thanking him, we're thanking him for what he's done for us in the past. That's about us. When we praise him, we're praising him for what he's going to do. That's still about us. But when we worship him, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about what he's done for me. It's not about what he's going to do for me. It's just about who he is. And when we begin to worship him for who he is, he begins to act on our behalf. Every single one of us have had somebody who has worked on our behalf. Maybe it was a good lawyer that stepped in and worked on your behalf. Maybe it was a good friend that stepped in and worked on your behalf and introduced you to who is now your husband or your wife. Maybe it was a good colleague or coworker who saw your potential and putting a good word for you with the manager. And now you got a promotion because somebody acted on your behalf. Look what Isaiah 64, 3 says, for when you did awesome things that we did not expect. How many can think of something that God has done for you, something awesome that you you didn't expect it? I didn't expect God to be that good. I didn't expect him to be on time like I didn't expect him to be that faithful. When you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains trembled before you. God will shake things up. And listen, here in the next few moments, God's getting ready to shake your world He's getting ready to shake things up in your life. You're tired of things being stuck in the rut and same old, same old. God's getting ready to shake it up. He says, since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. 
That's like a waiter waiting on you at the restaurant, serving you. Whenever we wait on the Lord, we're serving him with our worship. And he said, since ancient times, no one has heard. Since ancient times, no one has perceived. Since ancient times, no eye has seen a God who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. I can see God in heaven whenever we begin to worship him for who he is. He says, you know what? They're doing it right now. They're worshiping me for who? Hey, angel of, of deliverance, go. That family right there needs a deliverance. Mm, go, go. We begin to worship him for who he is. He's an angel of provision. There's a family over there that needs some provision. Go, 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 go now. That angel starts heading towards your home. Well, as we start worshiping for who he is, there's a prodigal son going loose. Go after him, angel. Go, go, go. He goes after that prodigal son and he brings him back home. And we don't even know how it happened. We just see miracles coming at the left and we see miracles at the right. We see God doing extraordinary things, things that we couldn't even imagine, things that we never expected. Why? Because God is acting on our behalf. It's the same thing that happened with Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas out there preaching the gospel and they get thrown into jail because they were doing something good. That's a perfect opportunity to complain, but they didn't. They got thrown in jail. They're shackled up to the old, dungy, grimy walls of that jail cell. They could have complained, thinking, God, where are you now? Why have you forgotten us? Why have you left us in here? We were just doing what you told us to do, and look where we are now. But that's not what the Bible says they did. You know what they did? They began to worship. They just began to sing a hymn to the Lord. And as they begin to worship, God did exactly what we just read in Isaiah. He began to make the mountains tremble. He began to shake the earth. And as the earth began to shake, all of a sudden, Paul and Silas and the other prisoners are there in the jail cell, and they start seeing dust fall from the from the, the rocks and the mortar was falling loose and all of a sudden the, there's a rattle of the, of the jail cell and, and all of a sudden things start falling apart and coming apart and all of a sudden the place is filled with smoke and dust and, and when it's all settled, the doors are open and the shackles have fallen off and they're wondering what in the world has just happened? Wow, that was some kind of song we just sang. That was some kind of worship that we just offered. God started acting on our behalf and they were set free, but not just them. Everybody in the jail cell was set free. And then the jailer, he gets saved. And then his family gets saved. All because Paul and Silas began to worship him for who he is. I'm going to tell you, God will do the same thing for you. He'll do the same thing for us. Amen.